to know really where to begin. <laughs> but uh, I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to really discuss three sort of characteristics of the hermit life, living alone, solitude, and then silence, and then um, prayer. Those three, that, and so at the end of the section on solitude, uh, we'll have a little pause, and if people want to ask a question or make a comment, and then we'll go on to sol uh, we'll go on to silence, and then to to prayer at the end. Um, a few things I should just say to kind of make it clear. Um, I, I did. Um, Saint Benedict is very wise. You've all heard of Saint Benedict, yeah. patron saint of Europe. He said, "Nobody should go on to live the life of a hermit." Till he's been thoroughly tried and tested in community. In other words, if you're running away from people and you can't live with people and you go off to be a hermit, that's not going to work. You've got to actually, and he, he encouraged, I mean, he actually, he thought a lot of his monks would go on to live the life of hermits, you know, after they'd lived in community. And I have done that because I, after I left school at the age of 19, I joined the monastery and I had four years of monastic life in, in a Benedictine monastery. I left before making my final profession and went to and studied at university and I did some teaching. And then after I went back and had a further four years in the monastery and with the help of a, a, pre, um, a monk, I did, there was a, a vocation to CERN that I had a vocation to be a hermit. But it was quite painful in a way leaving the monastery because I'd been at school there and I had time in the monastery and I loved it. But I felt more that I was being called to solitude and to the hermit life. And I mean, I had to get discernment, you know, go to a monastery, and, and then a, a very wise monk down at Mount Melry said, Rodney, if you go off to live in a lonely place by yourself, you might get fed up with it after a month, and that'll be it. You've got to build up the solitude gradually. So see if you can get, if you can find a cottage or somewhere where you can be for a while, say a month, and then go home, and then gradually increase the time you spend in solitude. And I was very lucky because my brother bought a cottage in Connemara in Rhinestone, a traditional, lovely traditional Irish cottage um, in a stunning place, very near the sea. And uh, he said to me that I could go up and, and spend some time up there. But he wasn't envisaging that I would be living there for 30 years. But, I mean, we had an agreement that if he wanted to come with his family, that I would go over to Kylemore and stay with the priest over there for a weekend or whatever, you know, he needed. And it did happen a few times in the early years. And then he developed, he had six children, and they... You know, if, if he came up, I would sometimes go and stay at home with my family. But basically, it was thanks to his little cottage in Roundstone that I was able to live the life of a hermit, you see. And that's just to give you a bit of a background to it. But um, uh, there, there, I'm going to, we're going to tonight, I'm going to discuss tonight three things. As I say, solitude, uh, silence, and prayer. And at the end of each of those sections, we'll stop and just have a little pause. And you might want to have time to digest it and maybe ask questions. So, one of the Desert Fathers, Arsenius, said, Flee, be silent, and pray always. Three characteristics of the hermit. Solitude, silence, pray always. And now, so I'm going to consider each of these in turn, starting off with solitude. Solitude. We enter into solitude to be with our Lord and with Him alone, to dwell in the gentle, healing presence of our Lord. He is the love of our life. He is beside us in all that we do, inspiring our thoughts and impulses and guiding our footsteps. Abba Elias said that he heard a voice which said to him, as soon as you turned to me, I was beside you. Now we also go into solitude to discover our true selves. Thomas Merton, who was like a modern day hermit, said that the desert fathers had come into the desert to be themselves and that they insisted on remaining human and ordinary. You see, when we're living in society, it is often difficult to resist the pressure to be what other people want us to be. And I actually, I can say that from experience, that, you know, in solitude you can really be yourself in some ways, because there's no pressures on you. But I'm now living in housing in Clifton, and, you know, people want you to be somebody. You know what I mean? There's a certain pressure on you when you're... And my mother used to say to me very often, said, Lord, Rodney, I would love to have lived that simple life that you lived as a hermit, close to nature in that little cottage. But she couldn't have done that, you know, she had children. And, but, but there is pressure on you when you're with people. And um, 
So the Desert Fathers had come into the desert to be themselves and that they insisted on remaining human and ordinary. When we are living in society, it is often difficult to resist the pressure to be what other people want us to be. We try to live up to their expectations of us. We often develop a false self, a persona, to cope with living in the world among other people. But in solitude, with God's help, we gradually get rid of our scaffolding. Our false self disappears and we discover our true self. The great discovery we make sets us free. The great discovery which we make sets us free so that God, that God loves us just as we are with all our strengths and weaknesses. I think that's a great thing to discover in life that God loves us with all our strengths and weaknesses. He knows what, we, what our good points are and what our bad Excuse points me. are. Um, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I am constant in my affection for you. I remember finding that a very, very consoling word from the Bible. That comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I am constant in my affection for you. God loves us for, with all up, our ups and downs. He never changes. He's constant in his love for us. We also learn to simplify our lives so that our sense of self does not depend upon what we possess or what status or qualifications, etc., that we have. As St. Francis said, I am what I am in God's eyes, no more and no less. Poverty, as I understand it, is to try, and, to, try to need less rather than to want more try and simplify our lives. But, and I don't want to suggest for one moment that the Desert Fathers and Hermits turned their back on people. That that's a thing that people would have said, you know, <coughs> Hermits are running away from people, they're turning their back on people. No, it's to that would be quite wrong. Um, Saint, Anthony the Great, Saint Anthony the Great, regarded as the father of the Desert Monks, took his solitude with him wherever he went, after he had spent 20 years in the desert. His solitude was a quality of his heart. After all his struggles and purification alone in the desert, his life was transformed and he had become a really compassionate human being. He had an extraordinary effect upon people who met him. They felt healed just by seeing him. He was fitted with such a quality of peace and harmony. There were three or four um, people who used to go and see St. Anthony every year. Uh, what, they made a pilgrimage once a year to go and visit him out in the desert where he was living his life as a hermit. And one of them never spoke to St. Anthony. The other three would talk to him, but one was always silent. So one year when he came, when the four of them came, St. Anthony said to him, he said, no, he said, you never say anything. Um, why is that? And he said, it is enough for me to see you, Father. Which was lovely. It is enough for me to see you. He didn't need to speak, you know. He just felt something was coming from the hermit, and he was just delighted and refreshed to see him. Compassion is the fruit of solitude. We suffer with our brothers and sisters. We enter in such, into solidarity with them. We give up measuring our meaning and value in relation to others. We become non-judgmental. You see, unfortunately, a lot of the time we're living with other people, we tend to compare ourselves to others. Oh, she's got a degree, or he's... He's in the rugby team, or at school there was great pressure, you know, you were nobody if you weren't in one of the teams, or, and I put everything into becoming a good cricketer because I thought I was nothing if I wasn't, you know. But you see, that's not the way it should be at all, you know. Um, we, compassion is the fruit of solitude. We suffer with our brothers and sisters. We enter into solidarity with them. We become non-judgmental. We stop forcing people to live up to our judgment of them. Many stories from the desert bear witness to this compassion. Do not have hostile feelings towards anyone. Do not dislike of anyone dominate your life. Real forgiveness becomes possible. There's a lovely story told about Abba Moses, who was asked to come and judge a disobedient hermit. So he came trailing a leaking jug behind him and said nothing. When asked what was the meaning of this, he replied, my sins run out behind me and I do not see them. And you ask me to come and judge another person. A compassionate person is so aware of the suffering of another that he is not aware of their sins. He has also come to know himself so that he is wary of judging others. I was actually sharing with my prayer group on Monday night. We have a prayer meeting in Clifton. A group of about five or six of us meet. 
and I was sharing with them how an extraordinary thing happened to me recently. I was thinking, you know, how could we possibly love, love your neighbour as you love yourself? How could you love your neighbour as much as you love yourself? Have as much of a desire for your neighbour to get to heaven as you want to get to heaven. Is that possible, I thought. And I recently had that experience that with God's grace, I actually felt somebody who was irritating me intensely. I felt a genuine fondness for them and a, des and a desire. I said, yes, I do love this person as much as I love myself, and I want this person to get to heaven as much as I want to get. It was a grace given to me. I couldn't possibly have... It wasn't coming, you know what I mean? It was, it was a grace that flowed into me. And I think you can do that. If you have, if somebody is, is annoying you or something, you can say, Lord, let your grace flow into me now. Let me see them as you see them. You know, and, 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 it, and it all alters. So that's the first section, so which is on, um, what do we say? It was on solitude, the importance of solitude. So does anybody want to comment on any of that or ask any questions about it? Do you think it's true? <coughs> yeah, Brian. Uh, how do you battle with um, I think it's boredom or acid day or, or that's a good good question actually yeah, yeah. how do you battle with it out there yes and when you're well I think actually I have to say hello um, it's a good question because you see I, I personally my mother said to me once she said Rodney I would love to have lived that simple life that you lived in the cottage so close to nature you see I love the sea I mean, and I love bird song, and I was very lucky when I was a Benedictine monk in England. There was a monk who used to take me for walks, and it was an Irish monk, an elderly Irish monk. And we'd be walking, you see, and he suddenly stopped. He said, Rodney, now stop talking. Do you hear that sound up there? That's a skylark. And when I'd learned the skylark, another day we'd go out to you. The, the elder monks would take the younger monks for a walk once a month. There was a thing called a month day when you went out to walk. And, uh, Another day he would say to me, now, stop talking. Do you hear that sound over there on the trees? That's a chaffinch. So I like, I learned all the bird song, you know. And I think one of the things that is a great help is if you're living in, in, um, in, in countryside, there's always an interest, you know. And I, I find that's very important. But there's still, your, your question is still valid, you know, that you do get that sometimes, that dryness does come over you, that acedia, you know. And uh, what do you mean by the word acedia? You mean a sort of a, a lack of wanting to... No. A lethargy, yeah. I a lethargy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, I all, actually, I do find, yes, sorry, I do find walking is a great help, you know. So what would you, what would an average day of love like? How does it work out, plan out? What would you do? Uh, you mean, how did I, well, well say, it's different now because I'm actually, I'm still a consecrated home and I made my profession as a home. I'm helping the priest in Clifton now. I'm actually living an extremely active life because I take communion to the sick four days a week and I'm the Saxon in the church, I open and lock the church and we were very short of priests, you know. But when I was, in 30 years I was in Rhinestone, I used to try and pray when I was fresh in the mornings. I did my manual work, like the, getting the turf down from the bog in the afternoons, and the water from the well, and that sort of thing. But I like to, see, the temptation would be to want to go straight out, but I wanted, if I, I wanted to be fresh when I was praying, because I got the gift of prayer, of contemplative prayer, and, you know, if you're nodding off to sleep all the time, it's not great. So I did try and give priority to my mornings for prayer and my afternoons for, um, for you know, doing the jobs that needed to be done. And relaxing as well, you know. And the other thing is that um, I, I think silence is very important, but I, I did, my, my brother-in-law insisted on getting me, I said, no, I, I don't, I won't have television and I, 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 I was reluctant to have a radio for some time, but he got me a radio they, got, they were in, in Scotland on holiday and they brought me this radio that worked off battery, long life batteries and I could play, play good music on it, you could play tapes on it as well. You know, but I did find that it became a struggle sometimes because living on your own, you know, the, the sound of a human voice is very comforting. <coughs> so quite often when I was sitting down to have my meals, my hand would automatically go out to turn on the radio to hear the human voice, you know, it's very comforting. So I, well, I, I devised a strategy which was to take the batteries out of the radio, <laughs> put the radio into the box and shove it away in under the bed. And when I confessed to the priest in confession that I was listening to far too much of the radio, he said, I think that strategy of yours was very good. I think you should take out those batteries and treat yourself to the radio and enjoy it on Sundays and on feast days, you know, special days, have your radio out, but discipline yourself, you know, and that would be a practical way of doing it. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. <coughs> and now, sorry? You've gone out in an average day. You've met a member of the 
Republic. Well, some non. Well, I, I would go out on a Sunday to Mars, obviously, you know, and I'd meet, have lunch in Randstone, and yeah, I would meet people sometimes. Yeah, and I had a very good friend called Peter Ward, who was a local man who would come in and help me with the turf. And if the sea water got into the well, and I needed somebody to um, to help me bail out the well, fortunately, I was given a mobile phone, but a very primitive one, which I still have, a little simple one, you know, this one that you, not a smartphone. So that was a great help because if there was if there were storms and the sea did get into the well, I could there was a very good friend who would come out and help me to bail out the well, you know. Um, but I wouldn't not you wouldn't get many people going out to that place, you know, during the day during the weekdays. Sometimes boat would pass, you know, but uh, um, but I did on I did a, I did socialise on a Sunday and and towards the end one other day in the week as well, you know. Um, any more? Yes, yeah, sorry, Pari. Yeah, yeah. I just want to explain a bit more. I know Rodney for about 15 years, and uh, he didn't paint the full picture of the solitude. Uh, I had the pleasure of going to where he did at one occasion. And when you hear about a, a nice cottage for the sea in Armstrong, you form a different picture of it than where Rodney did. First of all, he walked about a mile of the ball. I talked a mile anyway. But, and uh, there were a couple of plants above were ball grains. And uh, nothing when you got there. It was the most isolated house I was ever in in my life. So the picture of Rodney in a cottage in Ronslow by the sea, and it wasn't really Ronslow, it was off a road three or four miles from Ronslow before you reached and got into the ball, yeah. which you had to walk another uh, mile. I happened to be with him uh, when he was began to move out, and my brother in law brought. Quad, thinking he could go in and bring out some of the furniture. Rodney had a favourite chair that he wanted to bring yeah. out. But when I was moving into Clifton to yeah. accommodate him. He was moving Clifton, from yeah. the estate house into an apartment in Clifton. And the quad couldn't, you couldn't drive the quad, he got stuck. <coughs> so that, that's the picture. You could, you could only walk yes. for a mile to go right across the ball. Yes. Even though he was near the sea, he wasn't near the sea in the Yes, you could drive up to the sea. No. And I, my family, you see, encouraged. They, I was people said, "Why don't you get a boat? It's only six or seven minutes in a boat from the cottage to Ranston." But you see, I had no experience of boats, so my family said, "Rodney, I don't think you should get a boat. You've no experience of boats. You know, better for you to do the walking and then cycle into Ranston." But eventually, when people got to know me after say seven or eight years, I often got a lift into Ranston. But what Parika says is absolutely true. That. But actually, that's why I think you should circulate those photographs, Brian. <laughs> Brian's got some nice photographs that, of the cottage. It'll give you a, a very good idea of what they look, what it looks like. You see, it's um, I mean, there's a, if I a there's a picture of a boat going away with my empty um, a gas cylinders. You see, see that? Can you see that? We'll send that one around. You can just circuit, circulate around. And um, is it, is it another one here? The cottage. I think it stands across the cottage. I've got a picture. There's, the, there's a kind of a, a picture now, uh, one that you can see at the cottage. Yes. Yeah. Kind of, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Um, kind of the location to give you an idea. So there's the cottage. So if you just pass that down around and get a bit of an idea of the ground, what it's like, you know. Um, yeah, and come from this direction, we might get into it. Hi, yes. we were aware of loneliness. Oh, I did feel lonely sometimes. I did feel yeah. lonely sometimes. I did. It would be. I mustn't pretend that I didn't. But um, I ne there's a distinction, I think, between feeling loneliness and feeling alone. Now, there were a few times in the night when I woke up feeling a slight panic attack and very nervous. I put on my paraffin lamp, went and sat at the table, and I wrote a letter to Jesus saying, Dear Lord, I'm very sorry. I know I'm not living as strictly as I should be. Please help me now because I'm, I'm getting a panic attack. It was a storm actually, I think it was like Gale Force 9 or something, and I was feeling very nervous, you know. And actually, having done that, having got up in the middle of the night, written this little letter, I got back into bed and I fell asleep, you know. So there were times when it was, yeah, I mustn't pretend that it wasn't at times, but not very often actually. But I never, I mean, mostly I felt, and of course, then a great thing happened when um, I got permission from the parish priest and I think he must have done it through the bishop, um, to have the Blessed Sacrament in the house. That was absolutely wonderful. So I had communion every day then. I think I'd just become, a, when the parish priest introduced new Christian ministers. So with the permission of the bishop, Archbishop of Tume, um, I got 
I would go to the, um, after a Sunday Mass, I had a little pyx which the parish priest gave me, get collect six hosts so that I could have communion every day. And apparently, um, somebody who knew more about the hermit life said that was actually a tradition from the old days, from the hermits, who could only get to Mass once a week because of where they were living, but they could take the Blessed Sacrament with the permission <coughs> of the bishop and take it back to their hermitage and receive communion each day. And that made, made a very big difference. Having that presence and having the red light, the glow of the red light, which was on day and night in front mm -hmm. of it, in the, you know, in the, that was a huge help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you asked that question because that's reminded me of you know, things come to mind. You know, that was a vital thing, obviously. You know, mm -hmm. but not for the first six or seven years. I didn't have that. I've forgotten how long it was before I got that permission. You know, um, would you pray? Would you pray after the day? Oh, try to. Yes, I'm going to come on now to talking about prayer, actually. Um, and so that was the one section on solitude. Um, yes, I mean I would try and say the, the rosary every day, five decades of the rosary, and. The gift, you know, of just sitting silently praying, I think, and repeating the name of Jesus over and over was, was very strengthening. Um, <clears throat> just, will we come on now to silence, you think? Yeah. yeah. Um, silence is the way to make solitude a reality. The hermitage is properly a place where the whole life is brought back to listening to God. Frugality, you know, simplifying your life, solitude and other monastic disciplines are all directed to this end. And yet, a hermit can go to considerable trouble and put up with a lot of discomfort to live in external solitude and spoil the whole purpose of his life by too much noise. For example, I just I mentioned it to you already, having his radio turned on a lot of the time. This is to mitigate the loneliness that he feels. The sound of a human voice can be very comforting to one who lives alone. So you have to sort of be, be strict with yourself, you know. Of course, it is necessary for hermits to relax at times and to listen to music, tapes and the radio and also to show hospitality to visitors. Now that's a very important point. You never <coughs> turn anybody away. And I did get people who would call out sometimes, you know, they must have heard that I was living out there. And you would never turn anybody away and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not home, I don't, you know. If a person came out to see you, you made them welcome. You know, um, hospitality is very important. How right St. Benedict is to emphasize the great value of silence for monks. Um, sorry, that was, that's the wrong place. Sorry, where was I? Um, compassion, yeah. Um, Yes, silence. I do think that silence is very important today. Actually, I'm often saying this to the prayer group, you know, because we're so, you know, with, with television and with smartphones and things, I think a lot of us do live, it's very tempting to live very noisy lives, you know, and I think it is important to try and have some silence in our lives. And I say this um, very often in the prayer meeting, you know, we must have a, a try and, it's not easy, but it is important to have silence. How right St. Benedict is to emphasize the great value of silence for monks. Silence guards the life of the Holy Spirit within us, which is compared to a fire within us, which we must tend. Steam loses its heat if the doors are left open in a steam bath. We should have a tendency to silence at all times, even with visitors, and then we might have something really worthwhile or helpful to say. Alas, so often the door of our steam bath is left open, the words pour out, and we quench the fire of God's Spirit within us. We don't trust the spirit within us to touch people's hearts. One of the, uh, this is a very good quotation. One of the desert fathers said, I have often repented of having spoken, but I have never repented of being silent. I've often repented of having spoken. In much speaking, St. Benedict says, you cannot avoid sin. Sooner or later, if you talk too much, you're going to say something maybe unkind. You might be boasting about yourself. You might tell a lie. It's very difficult to avoid some kind of Minor sins, if you like, but if you talk an awful lot, you'd be a very remarkable person if you never tell a lie, or you never exaggerate, or you never say something unkind. I know that from experience myself. You know, and silence is actually very important. I think everybody, you don't, you, not just for monks and hermits, but I think everybody has to try and be aware of that. You know, the, the value of silence in our lives. Um, I mean, I've often gone back to my room and thought, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. But I've never gone back to my room and said, I wish I hadn't been silent. No, sometimes you do have to speak out. And it's cowardice not to. That does happen as well, I agree, you know. You can sometimes say, oh, I should, have, I should have corrected that. That was wrong, you know. So there is a kind of cowardice sometimes in silence. But on the whole, it's better to keep quiet, you know. 
um, if you can't say anything positive. <clears throat> um, so is that enough on silence and we go on to the next section? Um, so the, next, the final section is prayer. Prayer is the way to make solitude a reality. An unceasing prayer is the way to make our silence fruitful. The Desert Fathers do not offer any theory about prayer, but their wonderful stories and wise sayings were the stones used by later writers to develop their prayer of the heart, prayer of rest, the soul at rest in God. Isaac the Syrian said the way to God is through the heart. The heart here refers to the source of our emotional and volitional, i.e. the will, perception, the very centre or deepest centre of the person. Heart and will are synonymous. Some desert fathers describe prayer as the mind descending into the heart. Macarius the Great says the chief task of the monk is to enter into the heart. Let his prayer remodel his whole person. Unless we are praying with the heart, our vocal prayers are mere words and our meditation is little more than a philosophical contemplation of God. You know, it's like sometimes we say the rosary, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and death. Hail Mary, full of grace. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Hail Mary, full of grace. You know, but that's not really the way to pray. We've got to try and pray. Now, I do pray like that sometimes, but I think we're really trying to pray with the heart, that we're actually thinking about what we're saying. You know, we all fall into the business of routine, I suppose, when we... But I think that we should be conscious of the, of the need to be praying from the heart, you know. Um, but how are we to fix our hearts on God so that we are praying without ceasing, as St. Paul commands us to do? You see, St. Paul says we should pray without ceasing. How can we do that? Well, we need to use key words such as love, Repeat, you can just sit quietly repeating the word love or the word Abba, Father, or just the Jesus prayer, the famous Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner, or just repeating the, the word Jesus over and over again, which I also find very helpful and use a lot. In that beautiful book, The Way of a Pilgrim, a holy star, it's a spiritual father, teaches a Russian peasant, uh, a Russian peasant who is very anxious to fulfill St. Paul's command to pray without ceasing. He teaches him the Jesus prayer. The prayer becomes his true companion on his journey. At first it was a great struggle and effort, but eventually the prayer took over inside him even <coughs> while he was engaged in manual work or talking to others. You can get into the way of actually it, of it becoming part of you so that it's there. Um, eventually we find it becomes much less of an effort until we enter the prayer of rest the soul at rest in God. I would strongly recommend that in a real crisis, for example, trapped in an earthquake or underground train, if you keep repeating the Jesus prayer, Jesus, either just repeating the name of Jesus or Jesus, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. You know, it will calm you down. I have found this even, you know, I remember once I was in London and the train stopped for a long time between two stations and I was beginning to feel a certain kind of, because I, I do suffer a bit from claustrophobia, you know. I began to feel a sort of claustrophobia and anxiety welling up, but I kept repeating the name of Jesus and it de definitely calmed me down, you know. And I used to do that quite a lot in the cottage. If I began to feel anxious or troubled or lonely, if I kept repeating the name of Jesus, you know, it definitely was very calming and reassuring. Um, I think that's, that's a very, very vital thing. Um, so, any questions on that? Comments? Um, <coughs> When you became more active, yeah. you know, with the, with the church in Clifton and that, did yes. you miss? Did you miss? I, d I did actually. I tell you what I find is, you see, one of the things that ha and still happened to me is that I get very tired. You see, and I, I find that, you know, it's very hard actually to pray properly if you're tired. I just, uh, I'm daydreaming. You see, there's a pr daydreaming and prayer are not the same thing. I'm sitting down sometimes even in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and I'm not really praying. I'm, I'm really sort of daydreaming. But if you, the Jesus prayer can be a help there actually. You repeat that and try and think of whom, whom you're addressing. Um, but um, I, yes, I have to say in all honesty that I do miss solitude at times very much. I do. Um, but then I'm also very grateful that I've had this kind of opportunity of, you know, taking communion to the sick. I've come into the world of nurses and <coughs> doctors and sick people, which 
really was passing me by. I, I, I had no experience of it before, you know, because I've been blessed with good health. So I haven't been, I was only in hospital for my appendicitis when I was one and a half, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been quite an, an eye opener for me meeting nurses and the, seeing the compassion that they show to patients. I've learned a lot actually from going to the nursing home in Clifton and the hospital. And I'm now going to a day, the daycare as well for a few hours in the day. And so all that's been very good, you know. But it does mean sometimes I'm so tired. Well, we have funerals and weddings this year as well. But I'm just too tired to pray properly. It's just more difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. But I try and say the divine office every day in my rosary. And actually, I, what I use is I have a diary and I write down just because it keeps me up to it and give it a tick. Morning prayer of the church, holy rosary, five decades on, three decades if there's only three, you know. And it sort of encourages me to go back to my diary and keep it up, you know. Um, because you can easily let it slip by and excuse oneself and say, oh, I'm just too tired today. There was a funeral, there was a wedding, there was this and that, you know. But it, it, it is more of a struggle in some ways. Um. Um, can I ask, yes, do, do you please. think um, uh, being a hermit, is, is it a, a vocation? Oh, it is a vocation. It I is think a vocation. So. It is, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, definitely a vocation, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I couldn't, it was, I feel... I feel my, you know, like my life was planned out for me. I was very lucky. Um, it's extraordinary. I, right the way, looking back on my life, you know, even when I was living in London, and then I remember one Sunday, a Benedictine monk who had taught me, whom I wasn't particularly friendly with, he used to teach gymnastics and that at prep school. That was between the ages of, say, 9 and 13. But he called to see me, and he told me that he'd been to a day of renewal in Westminster. And he said, I, I was very impressed, Rodney, by the, the, the really genuine sincerity and the spirit that they showed those people. He said, you ought to go. They have a th what's called a day of renewal every third Sunday down in Westminster Cathedral Centre. So I went down, and at first I was a bit put off because I mean, we'd, the Benedictine, we'd grown up in very sort of definite, you know, how can one say, formal sort of prayer. You know, it wasn't this charismatic prayer, you know. So, I, But I did eventually come to feel that I met people who had something which I didn't have. They had a kind of a joy, <coughs> a joy and a peace uh, strength, which I kind of lacked at that time. So I, I, I kept going back, even though I had a bit of a struggle at first to accept it, but I went, kept going back. And then somebody came up to me and said, where about in London are you living? So I said, I'm living in North London, in Hampstead. And they said, well, there's a prayer meeting which meets in a Church of Ireland presbytery every Tuesday night. Um, it's 70% Roman Catholic and 30% non-Roman Catholic. So I started going to that, and I must say, it was a very good experience, you know, going every Tuesday, going... So I arranged to, to go on, a, have my day off on a Tuesday, so that I could fresh in the evening to go to that. You know? So that 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 is that, that is important, I think. Um, um, I sorry, yeah. I was just wondering, how was your role, you know, as a hermit in mm. the wider community? Mm. And I'm just thinking of things like events in the the wider world such as now we're all surrounded by the news mm. about coronavirus, yeah. etc. <laughs> did you, how much did you keep, I suppose there's two parts, how much did you keep in touch with what was going on in the white world outside? And how much was your, was there an outreach time in your prayer where you'd been, would you Thank kind you of this. deliberately do that? Yes. As part of your prayers? Well, I would, you see, because also, <coughs> see, Paddy Brown, who was the, he's still alive, he's going to be, he's going to be 100, he's 98 now, this is a man who lives in Roundstone, he was a Dubliner, got a house in Roundstone, he used to take me to Mass on Sundays, and he would tell me, you know, about things that were happening. And also, I would, I would get a Sunday newspaper sometimes on Sunday, you know, and have, read it at my lunch, so I did keep in touch with, with, new, with the news of the world, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, are there any, any other questions? Yeah? <clears throat> you mentioned that you had visitors, and I'm wondering, like St. Anthony, did you have individuals who were compelled to return to see you? Yes, I did actually. They, they came back, yeah, they did. Yeah. And those, can you elaborate a little bit on those relationships or an example of those relationships? Uh, let me just think, um, people who came out to see you on a regular basis. Um, well, the fraternity of Mary Immaculate Queen, do you know who they are? Yeah. Uh, some of them would be here. They were very good friends. Trish he was <coughs> here, and uh, how did that, that was very interesting. I went to, and Kate, yes, Trish and Kate. Um, how did that come about? Um, I'm just trying to think now how I got to know about the fraternity, how the original contact was. Um, 
on the Nigel and you were at the airport. Brian and I went to um oh, prior to that you were sorry what well, you were at the airport going on a nine air flight to go there. Oh that's right, that was extraordinary. Yeah. So I was going over to we were going to France myself. There was a there's a very, very they were very good friends to me, Seamus and Rose We Lap, and they're still running a pottery shop in Ranstone today. Um, Seamus and Rose We Lap and the potters. He was a great help to me because uh, especially when I got the mobile phone, he would come out very often to help bail the well with me. And he was also very good. He was the man who got me to grow vegetables, my own vegetables, so I didn't have to drag them across the bog. He was very good at vegetables, you know. But anyway, he and his wife um, were going to Paris, and we had, I had a, holiday, a week's holiday with the two of them. And while we were waiting for the flight in Shannon Airport, I noticed there was this lady there, dressed a bit like Trish, in white, and she was saying her rosary, you see. So I got chatting to her in Shannon Airport, and fortunately, there was a seat, there were two seats, so we sat together on the flight to Paris from Shannon, and uh, my two friends, Rosemary and Seamus, sat behind. And I got very friendly with, with this, with uh, Donna. And, we, and she was very good, because that's when I met her, was in Paris, and then, then I went off, Seamus and Rosemary and myself were on the holiday, and then that was the end of seeing Donna. But Donna kept me in her prayers, and if there was ever some something that she wanted to be prayed about, she would contact me by text message, Rodney, such and such has happened, would you ever pray? And she kept in touch with me, actually, for a number of years, and eventually then I came to go and visit where the community was in Barna, here in Barna. And I started to go then regularly once a month to the, what was it we had once a month? The Adoration. Adoration of the Blessed Son. And I'd stay overnight on a Saturday night, yeah. That was a great source, and that's how I got to know Brian and Trish and Kate and you know, so the, the Lord, it's wonderful, the mysterious, and wonderful way he works, you know. But it was very good with, with Donna, because if there was some crisis coming up <coughs> in the national, it was to do with various things that were happening, you know. She said, Rodney, please pray, we're, we're going to the voting about something, you know. It was anything like that. I can't remember what the incidents were now, but there were things of a na of, in the news, and, that, and she would always ask me to pray. So I kept in touch, and eventually then I went and saw her community, you know. <laughs> So any I more feel, questions? I see you in prayer. Hmm? I see your life that you're living would be very beneficial for all the people around the area. Yes. And even out to the wider world. Well, actually, I'm, I'm very involved with people, with quite a lot of elder, elderly people in Clifton, actually. Mm -hmm. I've got some very good friends who are elderly people. And I used to take communion to a very nice man. You might have heard of him. What was his name? The man who lived up there <clears> on the hill. Um, I'm getting so bad. I'm getting awfully forgetful. <laughs> I, I mean, mean you pray alone. You can't tell me. Uh, yes. Yeah. That, that would do so much good to the whole, the whole area. Well, I hope so. Yes, I hope so. <coughs> but it's one has to battle with oneself because you know I'm no different from anybody else when it comes to things like laziness and you know I have to overcome, to force myself sometimes. You know, but you're quite right. Prayer is is very valuable. You know. Um, the Arabic prayer meeting here in town. Not well. Prayer meeting here in town. I don't think so. Apart from Barna. No. But out in Clifton, we, have, we meet on a little group of us. Meet. I'm very lucky. There's, um, there's a Franciscan nun who was in Egypt for a number of years. She's a very prayerful, very, very holy prayerful nun, and she comes to, to it. You know. So we, we have about four or five of us attend it on Monday night. Um, it's great, and it's, it's, it is wonderful. A prayer meeting is actually a great help, I must say. Very supportive. Very supportive. Can I ask, um, are there many um, women who, who yes. are yet nuns or, that are hermits? Yes, there are actually. There was a lady, I'm sure you must have seen, heard her on the television. She was living at the sort of the foot of Crow Patrick, I think. No, yes. that, what was her name again? I meant to see her once, yeah. Forgot what her name is. Um, and there are some monks, I think, as well. Yeah. But maybe not as common as they used to be. I think Ireland produced a lot of hermits at one time. You know, patron saint of Cork and Dublin. I mean, Kevin Glendalough and Finn Barron, Hooven Barra, um, were hermits. Um, but in modern, uh, modern today, yeah. are there many? Well, the man now, actually, interestingly, my spiritual, so keep in touch? My spiritual director for five years has just <laughs> been moved on from Galway, Father Philip Falker in the Franciscan church, in the Abbey Church, you know. He, he, he lives as, lived as a hermit. He has a little Nice of his own at the back of the friary, and he was very much. He used to say the eight o'clock mass for the four clairs in the morning, early mass for him. 
So he, he was, it was a great help to have a spiritual director, actually, who was, who was, had experience of hermit life, you know. I mean, for, for example, one of the things, one of my sort of things I'm always going on about is that we need to spread, we're so blessed as Catholics and as Christians to have the good news of the gospel. And there's so much bad news coming through all the time on the, on the news, you know, on the radio. You turn on the news, you read the paper, there's so much bad news. And I say, I used to say to Father Philip, you know, I feel this great desire to, to spread the good news of the gospel. He said, Rodney, you are a hermit. Your job is to pray for the situation, not to preach. That's not your vocation. You're not a preacher. But I, actually, I, I explain how I get around that because <laughs> I do a lot of them. Um, nowadays, I do a lot of travelling on buses, especially um, CityLink. I'm lucky enough I have free travel because I'm over 70. So I have free travel on CityLink, and so I take the bus very often from Galway to, sorry, from Clifton to Galway, and from Galway, and I'm going down to my family in Cork, Galway to Cork. And it's a brilliant service, CityLink. But now, I've had some very good <coughs> encounters on the city on the CityLink bus. I'll give you an example. Recently, the bus was leaving Clifton, 9:15, and a German man and his wife got on the bus just before it left Clifton. And they, I was sitting here. German man sat there. His wife was sitting over there. And <clears throat> how it came about and the, con the conversation got going at all, I don't know, because I was very much thinking I was going into Galway, and I had a session booked with Father Philip, my spiritual director, so I wanted to be very quiet on the bus to get my thoughts together so that I could have a decent session with Father Philip. But anyway, I said to myself, all right, when we get to Uchtrol, I'm going into silence. So we got talking, the German man and myself, and he told me, he told me that he was an atheist, you see. So I said to him, well, that's very interesting. I said, could you tell me why you're an atheist? Well, he said, the reason I'm an atheist, he said, is because there are lots of things we don't understand at the moment. But he said, I think the time will come when we will understand them. Now, he didn't say this in an aggressive way. What was really nice about this man was he was a gentle man. He didn't say it in an aggressive way, like some atheists would do. They'd say, oh, I don't believe in all that rubbish about religion and God. I don't believe in it. That was not him at all. He was very gentle. He just said very gently. But actually, he said, I, I, don't, I don't. I think the time will come and we will know the answer to some of these questions. You know. Then he said to me, now, what about you? Do you believe in God? And I said, I do. I do, I believe in God. He said, <coughs> may, I ask, may I ask you why you believe that there's a God? Well, I said, I lived, I lived for nearly 30 years in a cottage in a very remote place out on the bog. And I said, I was being looked after and I could, no way could I have survived out there on my own if there wasn't a God looking after me. I, I, I felt the presence of God taking care of me. And also, on a wider scale, my whole life has sort of been, seems to have been planned for me. So he was... That was fine. And then, without my even, even having to say anything, he kind of went into a sort of silence, and I went into a silence. And then when I was getting off the bus at NUI Galway, and I shook hands with him and his wife to say goodbye, and I hope I'm not boasting now, but he said to me, um, you're a very good witness for your faith. You're a very good witness for your faith. So I felt that at least I'd given him something to think about. You know, it wasn't an aggressive thing. It was very nice. And the other thing which I'm always preaching to my prayer group, I shouldn't be preaching, but I'm always preaching to the prayer group, I say, <laughs> we, must be, we mustn't be afraid of making the sign of the cross when we're on the bus <coughs> if we're passing a church. You know, okay. You know, you're witnessing to your faith if you make that sign of the cross. And there was one occasion when I was sitting, there was, I was, I'm an awful coward, by the way. I don't, often I don't, you see. But I was sitting here and there was a woman inside me so when, when we passed a cross in Moy Cullen, a, a church in Moy Cullen, I made the sign of the cross, and I noticed when we got to the next church, she made it before I got there, talked about <laughs> So the message got the cross there. And um, there was some other thing too. Yes, another occasion when I was, I was going down to Cork on a city link bus, and I was saying the rosary very quietly under the seat, as I thought, and nobody would notice me. And when I was getting off the bus, this lady came over and she said very quietly, I hope you don't mind me saying this to you, but I couldn't help noticing coming down that you were saying your rosary. And she said, I was so glad to see you saying the rosary because it seems to be dying out, but people aren't saying it like they used to when I was younger. So you see, little things like that are very important. And I've got a friend called Sarah, who and we meet up quite often. She always says to me, we go for a meal in a restaurant, Rodney, aren't we going to say grace? And I, sort of, I, I find it most embarrassing of all is in a restaurant saying grace, you know. 
making the sign of the cross and bless us, O Lord, for these and all thy gifts which you are about to receive through your bounty. She always insists on saying it. And again, it's a question of, you know, you're witnessing to your faith. And it's not easy because we don't like to embarrass people. And, but you see, we may, we're actually probably helping some people. We think to us, the devil says to us, oh, don't be doing that now. You're only going to be embarrassing people. Don't make them feel uncomfortable. <coughs> That's the devil talking. <laughs> it's the good Lord who's saying, come on, have the courage to do it, you know. So, I mean, that's it. I think that's how we witness. These are the kind of ways we can witness to our faith, you know. We don't, we don't, we don't only do it by actually preaching. We can do it in all sorts of little ways, can't we? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Have I said enough? Maybe, yeah. Thanks very much, Rodney. Okay, thank you.